fields around protoplanetary nebulae measured with dust polarization. And Albert talking about bipolar planetary nebulae and galactic bulge and how they statistically appear to be aligned in terms of polar axes. Uh, Andreas talking about the first synchrotron jet toward a post AGB star. And finally, David gives us a nice tour of column 12 observation. So, who would like to, to kick things off with a I have a question for the speakers. I have a question for Albert. So, you say your alignment, basically, you say you would have a preferable direction for these white binaries. So, do you have measurements in this? So, can you, can you, is there a possibility to make to test this prediction with observations? Uh, no, we don't have any uh, direct evidence for orientation of binary orbits. First, you have to, of course, assume that these white binaries are given by both. This is an health and assumption. But the white binaries would have a higher angle momentum and be more stable against disturbances over the evolution of the, the, the star. Uh, but uh, to measure a direct inclination for a binary, white binary system is very hard. Um, for close binaries, you might see an effect in the number of eclipses that you see. Depending on the orientation, it's a, it's a small difference. For white binaries, I don't think it's easy. People have looked at it in, in young clusters. They looked at the alignment of uh, stellar rotation and stellar jets in the uh, young cluster, and in those cases, no alignment has been seen. Now, furthermore, and, uh, well, Albert and I talked about this a bit when he visited RIT, but one, one interesting check or test for something on this whole question would, would be to look at young clusters and take a look at orientations of binary stars in young clusters. I suspect they're at random orientations. That would you mean you don't believe it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. But I, I, it, it, the, data, the data are there to, to just do such a simple statistical test. I think. For, for example, in the Orion Nebula cluster. The distribution of binaries is pretty well determined on the sort of size scales I think we're talking about because of all of the uh, AC, all the ACS imaging that has, has been done in the Orion Nebula cluster. Just a thought, which I asked one of my students in, at the time when Albert, Albert and I gave a, a, a presentation for a group of assembled students, and I asked my students to take this problem on, and no one volunteered, so maybe someone. <laughs> but then, if people have been done tests in the, the solar neighborhood, they've not found evidence of alignment. And so the assumption is that the magnetic fields in the galactic bulge were much stronger at the time these stars formed than they are nowadays in the solar neighborhood. This speculation. Other questions, comments, accusations? <coughs> Uh, yes, I have a question for Lorenz about the polarization, the dust alignment in CRL 618. Uh, from the map that you showed, uh, the continuum, it seems like you didn't resolve the radio continuum emission. And uh, I mean, it was just like a, like a block there, like this circular thing. And, and then you, you showed like the vectors align like uh, parallel to the outflow. So I was wondering if. Um, yeah, I mean, since you didn't resolve, then uh, I was wondering how strong or how, uh, uh, or, or if we can actually tell that the magnetic field is aligned or globally aligned or has a perforation alignment. I mean, maybe we can just tell that there is one vector in that direction, you know, and we would need to resolve more of the emission in order to tell more about the distribution of the uh, magnetic vectors. What do you think? Yes, for that source for CRL 616, also for some blocks, I was having a discussion with them with, um, with about this object a few years ago. Um, you have some parts that, yeah, they are a bit, they are smaller than the than the than the beam. Yeah. Uh, I didn't give, unfortunately, from the, the talk, I didn't give the the error that we have on the, on the detection of the polarization. So the, the, using 
We had a really good coverage. We had a really good calibrator, polarization calibrator, so we could go to all point. Uh, for example, the polarization, the percentage of polarization that we detected in CR618 is so 1% plus or minus 0.1. So we are pretty confident in that. That's why actually I would like to go deeper and to know for sure, because those, of course, are the f it's the first step to see if we can if we can detect something. So that's why I would like to go further down to smaller beam and then see if, how is the how is the alignment of the of the vectors. I'm wondering how do we get those 
well, as, as far as I can tell you, the white dwarfs and single stars are not going to rotate at the end. So probably like North House uh, was talking about, you need uh, to break up a brown dwarf or a planet around and make a disc around them. I had no answer. Maybe you want to answer so? Guillermo, do you uh, have a sense? I remember in uh, Jason's paper about the uh, quenching of the magnetic field uh, in AGB stars. Uh, that he said if we could somehow tap the uh, convective energy a little bit like the sun would do, I mean, in the, in the alpha when you got a dying case, then maybe we can reinstate some rotation. And I know that there was Eric, he's not here now, but Eric Blackman had a paper earlier that was saying that this could be possible. I think nowadays it's not the usual thing with theorists. But uh, so do you have any opinion about uh, maybe reinvigorating rotation with some mechanisms we're not thinking about yet? He wants to answer. <laughs> yeah, so I so of course I guess um so yeah the, the whole thing about the sun, um so if you can sustain the dynamo I think you in principle don't need to have an opinion, but the problem there is that you have to basically have to build up the field inside the star. So you just keep storing and storing and storing it. And um, if you do that, then it's about at the time when the HB should add you to have enough field strength. But the problem is it's really hard to do that. Um, I think it would probably dissipate some of it or there's some sort of, I don't know, connection going on this there. But, uh, technically, it might be possible, but it, it seems to be, I think, what it would be very in the sun. So this is a good opportunity, since Jason's work has been brought up, to put back into play some of the theoretical talks we heard on Tuesday. Um, I was reminding myself of that. Uh, for example, Martin Huarte Espinosa talked about modeling the formation and evolution of wind cast capture disks and binary systems. Uh, you know, Sun Kim talked about uh, certain stellar rings versus spirals in binary uh, generated by binaries, um, complementary to the work that uh, Shazreen was, was showing us. Um, Muhammad Akashi was talking about impulsive ejection of gas in bipolar nebulae. Um, and there's Jason's talk. So I just want to throw that back into the mix because this, this, this session sort of encompasses the entire conference in a sense. Um, so we should try to link these uh, presentations you saw today, some of which were most of which were observation based, apart from Guillermo's perhaps, right? So, comment? Yes? Um, I guess just the question for us to think about is how to, I mean, this, the work on the fields is remarkable, and it, what's really exciting is to see it coming from a bunch of different directions now. You know, we have implications of field, both from the masers and the um, dust and the uh, um, synchrotron jets. So the thing to do is try and unify these, I think, to try and get better sense of what the field, what are field strengths, what are reasonable field strengths that we should be using at different um, distances. Because uh, obviously what we're really interested in making the connection to what part of it is the field, the launching, like what's actually happening in the sword engine, a disc or a rotating star. With a comment. Speakers, would you like to comment on any of the papers, the theoretical papers I just mentioned, and perhaps speculate as to how your work can be used to constrain such since you're all lined up against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Distances. If your different methods could give us 
the same field, approximately the same field at different distances, we could be able to link that back to what's going on in the engine. That's the nice part about that. Well, yeah, there's, there's fairly consistent measures now coming from the, the main set lines. You know, that uh, goes up to some tens of hours at the, uh, at the position of the star. But you have to be careful that these mazes are clumped. And the field in the clumps might not be the same as the field outside the clumps. Maybe conservation there. Uh, but apart from that, it seems to be fairly consistent. But what about like, also, but now we have the Sigatron jets, and also you know, we have these different ways now of measuring fields, so. Yeah, yeah that, that's a very nice result, and uh, I'm sure it's very important, and it's probably very helpful. It's hard to add to them at the moment. It's only a single measurement at the moment. It would be nice to have more. Uh, but uh, the other thing I was wondering about, how does the magnetic field couple to the gas? The gas is molecular, does it see a magnetic field? So when you say that the thermally, uh, the thermal energy is less than the magnetic energy, you still need a coupling mechanism for that to be relevant. I can speak to that. Um, well, it depends on what kind of mechanism you're thinking of. You can, even with very low ionizations, like 10 to the minus 5 ionization fractions, you'll still get strong coupling between the ionized part, which is tied to the fields, and the rest of the gas. The drag works very effectively. So this is why, you know, even in, that, in, in uh, uh, molecular clouds, where you know, have almost no ions at all, you still, the field still plays a role. So, um, so that's the case when you have the, as Eric talked about, you have the fling method when you're, you know, sort of spinning things up. Um, there, the kinetic energy dominates at some radius, um, but the field was the field, still pretty, pretty clearly tied to the, um, the gas. In the magnetic tower case, where really the, the cavity is empty, it's just magnetic field, there it's the, the gas is all being swept up by the magnetic field. So it's just like a spring, a, you know, an invisible spring pushing material forward. So there the gas is coupling just because it's all being swept up. It's an ambient gas, you know, or circumstellar gas that's being pushed. Yeah, another, another point there is we, we saw beautiful results uh, Spacing out of people's names again. Oh, Carmen showed up. Carmen Sanchez Contreras showed us some beautiful results. Guillermo, I think, showed us some beautiful results for, for massive star envelopes in which there's a fair, fra uh, an important component of molecular ions present. And presumably, from modeling the chemistry, one could get the, the ionization fraction uh, in, in these. Envelopes, and then you might be able to answer that question. And then, Alma, Alma, Alma. Maybe we could actually map the, the, the difference, the, the gradient in ionization fraction, and that might help us understand, especially relating it to magnetic field strengths along the flow, whether there's any coupling whatsoever between magnetic fields and, and molecular ions. So that's just something to throw out there. Another, many of the speakers I just mentioned. Um, our team, thanks so much. Anyone else um, have any questions for me? <laughs> or any comments on the presentations that were on, on observational results that might help constrain the models? Donald? It's, it's about the, the measurement of the magnetic field from lines, from line polarization. It, which which uh, mechanism to polarize the measures? Are you assuming? In, because I, I am afraid that you. See well, see my wells. So you must assume some, some mechanism for, for polarizing the bases uh, different for, for simpler and linear polarization. Can, can you explain that? Uh, on the circular polarization, we're just uh, measuring the zero-sympathy. So, um, yeah, from, so, so then we have the, the from the piece talks that I showed. Uh, the, that S shape that I shown, that is a, a signal of the zenith splitting, and the, the model assumes that to, to make the calculation of the field strength and, and in the S value basis, which are mostly linear. Yeah, the polarization of the SIO, you have to take an account that the pumping mechanism is in there and it can be uh, anisotropic, right? Then anisotropic pumping also generates uh, uh, polarization, linear polarization. Then what you have to be sure of is trying to, 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 determine, to determine the, the 
ratio between the simulated emission rate and, the, and all the mechanisms that make you lose uh, the photons from the, from the major, major <coughs> transition. In the SIO region, in the SIO measures, you can easily get fraction of linear polarization more than the Seaman, more higher than what the Seaman uh, splitting or Seaman frame can predict, right? Seaman, uh, in, this, in, the, in this context, uh, we have, you have like a maximum of 30% of linear polarization that you can observe. But when you go away and observe, then you get 70%, 80%. Then you have to be careful interpreting this this, 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 this result and the linear polarization is like given by the because the semi splitting is not strong enough to, to separate the to, to split the two magnetic sub sub levels of the magnetic uh, what is this in fact in fact it is something that like the whole right skill of this effect similar to the world effect and in that case we only